Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to this post-summit briefing and EPC update, our regular look at developments in and around the European Union. My name is Jackie Davis, I'm a senior advisor to the European Policy Centre and with me this week as always, Yanis Emanoulidis, Director of Studies at the European Policy Centre and Fabian Zulig, Chief Executive at the EPC. And our special guest this week, joining us a little later on, Sophie Pornschlegel, Senior Policy Analyst and Connecting Europe Project Leader at the EPC. As always, totally interactive discussion, questions from me, and later on, I hope, from all of you. You are all muted for now, but if you want to ask a question, you can click on the raise hand buttons and I will activate your microphone and now ask you to turn it on at the appropriate moment, or write your question in the Q&A box, not the chat box, please, the Q&A box, and please keep it brief. Um, so let's start uh, with an overview. We are going to focus the entire hour today on what has been happening at the European Council. Um, we come to you very much live. Uh, those post-summit press conferences haven't got underway as we came on air. They may have by now, but uh, the final conclusions aren't out. But we like to bring you very hot analysis. So let's get a little bit of a sense of where we are, Yanis, overall. Um, they have an awful lot on their plate at the moment. Loads of different issues were due to come up. Where was the focus in the end at this summit? Well, first of all, as you said, they're still having the summit. Um, they, a couple of minutes ago, switched to digital for migration. Um, but if you look into what has happened up till now, also in terms of the focus, but also the public attention or the po political attention, there have been two issues which have been at, at center stage. One is uh, the energy prices um, or energy crisis, as some are already calling it. Um, that was clearly a focus yesterday where their deliberation took much longer than originally expected uh, for many hours. And they had to come back to the issue again um, after they were discussing the council conclusions, the final version of it. So this is something which took them much longer. And then they had on not on the official agenda, but it imposed itself on the agenda an exchange about uh, rule of law issues, especially with the, the situation with respect to Poland. Um, so this was something which originally was not on the agenda. Also, Charles Michel, the president of the European Council, had tried to push it so that it wouldn't dominate the summit. But at the end of the day, there was a discussion about it. Um, it was not as heated as a discussion we witnessed uh, in June when we had a discussion, especially with Hungary and LGBTIQ+. Um, this time it was not as heated, but they had a frank exchange. We'll so these were the two on, issues, yes. Come exactly. back on some of the detail of that later. Um, but there was, as you say, there were also other issues. They did talk about COVID. They updated themselves. At a moment, uh, Fabian, when cases are rising again, a number of countries appearing to be on the verge of or already in a fourth wave, um, lots of lots of issues to tackle. And also Angela Merkel's probably last summit, uh, her 107th, uh, Charles Michel revealed she had attended 107 of the 214 summits there have ever been, precisely half of all EU summits ever. That's a measure of how uh, huge the gap will be when she's gone. How would you assess, Fabian, with all this on the table, the mood music right now? I mean, Charles Michel said in his invitation letter, I am confident we will have a productive meeting in a spirit of trust and dialogue. Was his confidence misplaced or did you see trust and dialogue? Well, I think um, the, the question of trust uh, in particular, when we see uh, some of the issues which were on the table, um, uh, is uh, a big question. I think dialogue may be, um, uh, but in a sense, uh, what we have here is a number of ongoing crises, uh, which the European Union has to deal with, some of them external, some of them very much internal. Um, so the summit uh, was not an easy summit, um, but also um, dialogue there might be, but how constructive it is um, depends a bit on the outcomes. Um, and I think what we are seeing now is not necessarily a lot of progress on many of the issues which have been discussed. Mm, indeed, I mean, and some leaders did express a frustration, Yanis, at precisely that saying we're not making progress on the big issues because of some of these tensions and difficulties between us. And we'll come back in a moment to the energy crisis and the arguments over that, uh, fierce arguments over that, and then over Poland. But how do you assess that mood and that lack of uh, the trust that you need to have constructive dialogue rather than obstructive dialogue? 
I think if you look into the overall mood in the European Council, and then you also take a bit of a longer term perspective, you can say that things have become more difficult. Um, there's not only a lack of political cohesion, but also between uh, the members of the European Council, heads of state and government, there is an increasing level of uh, not only distrust, but also open conflict when they meet. Um, if you compare that to the past, there were difficult, very severe, difficult situation, but you often hear it also afterwards that the level of cooperation between member states, heads of state and government uh, was still at a certain level um, and they were able to communicate. They were not having an open fight about issues. Now we see a lack of cohesion and we see also that the relationship between the members of the European Council is becoming, are, is becoming more difficult. This is also where uh, the fact that um, Angela Merkel is leaving will leave um, a certain vacuum uh, because she has been someone, um, as Bettel described it, um, the compromise machine, someone who was in difficult moments, not only because she was obviously re representing Germany as the biggest country uh, in the European Union, but also personally, she was someone who came up with ways of finding a compromise and really actively, proactively seeking that compromise between heads of state and government. Um, so I think from that perspective, she will be missed in a, an increasingly more difficult situation. Absolutely. And some genuine emotion, I felt, looking at those scenes uh, of them talking about her role. There was a video from Barack Obama. She seemed moved by it all. But Fabian, um, of course, it's no guarantee she won't be back for the December summit because this is all predicated on uh, the negotiations on the new coalition coming to a conclusion before that. I know that's the goal. <laughs> what are the chances they're going to have to say goodbye? all over again in December? I think given where things are in Germany, they are rather small. Um, there isn't really a choice uh, but to have uh, the traffic light coalition um, and uh, the talks are now progressing. Um, I'm sure they will be difficult in some areas, um, but I think it's uh, very clear that the final outcome is not in doubt. Um, so I would expect that also in Germany there will be uh, a wish of the whole political system to move on and uh, to, to get into government um, for, for these parties. Um, so I think it's very unlikely she's back um, in the role of the head of the German government. Uh, I think it's even more unlikely she will be back in any other role. So I think this really was her last summit. Thank you very much. Just, okay, let's, yeah, sorry, Yanis. Just yeah. one small point. Sure. Um, hey, with respect to the mood music, I think it's also interesting to witness that this European Council reminded much more of what we've had before the COVID-19 crisis. Right? You had the press being present, you had the people mm -hmm. in, uh, in the, in the Justus Lipsius building. So for those who have witnessed um, many summits in the past, it reminded much more of the past normality, um, although still we're not obviously in a new normal, but we are in a different situation, but it's moving closer in that direction. You can sense that also with respect to summits. But you can also sense a certain nervousness given, as I say, the conversation yes. about COVID, about where we are, about the fact that countries, including Belgium, now saying it's on at the beginning of a fourth wave, a sense right. of has this not, will this normalcy last? for very long, or where are we going to be by the time of the December summit? So not over by a long way, Fabian. Yeah, maybe, maybe to add to that also, um, and I think this is not so much on the radar yet, but it's not only the question of uh, a fourth wave, it's also a question of where the um, economies are going. Mm. Um, because there was this general feeling that uh, we have um, gotten over the worst of it. It's now uh, on the way up. There's a recovery. But some of the signs, both in Europe and globally, are starting to look distinctly less comfortable. Um, so what we might actually be seeing is an end of the rebound, which came after everything was opened up again. Um, so we could also be facing a much more difficult economic situation, and that links into what we're going to talk about in a minute in terms of the, the energy, which um, clearly energy prices also will have an impact mm. on the strength of recovery. And then without wishing to depress us all further, that warning from the World Health Organization, one of the things EU leaders were talking about was international solidarity. World Health Organization warning only yesterday, the pandemic, they say, is likely to last a year longer than it needed to have because of a failure to roll out the vaccines right across the world. So another issue they'll have to come back to. But let us turn, uh, and you just mentioned it, Fabian, to the discussion 
on soaring energy prices. This turned out uh, to be what we would call in English a humdinger. It took four hours, and as you say, they had to come back to it. There was a furious argument uh, between very different views of what the EU should or shouldn't do. Should it do anything at all? Yanis, can you just take us through a little bit what the argument was about and where they ended up? Yes, as you said, there are um, different uh, camps uh, in the European Union. Um, there is no common understanding position on what needs to be done, especially when it comes to the mid and longer term perspective. There's more agreement on what could be done more immediately, especially at the national level with the support uh, also from the Commission. But we, And there's an awareness for the overall problem, but when it comes to coming together and defining out what needs to be done, there are differences. Let me just mention some of them. Um, one is that there are very different readings with respect to uh, why energy prices have increased and what the situation will look like in some months' time. Um, and there are three camps. There's this uh, first camp, uh, including the Dutch, the Germans, um, who see that there are particular reasons why we now have increased um, energy prices, which have to do with the recovery, the COVID-19 recovery, which have to do also with uh, uh, seasonal weather conditions over the summer with lower production of renewables. Um, so they're saying this is something which is now something which we have to fight now now, but the situation might be different in some months time. Then there's the other camp uh, led especially by, uh, by the Spanish, but also supported by the French, by, Ma by President Macron, who is arguing, no, this is a much more severe problem. Uh, energy prices will remain at very high levels. So we also need to take more firm action at the European level and also think about in, uh, regulatory uh, changes, which we need to put in place with respect to the energy market. And then you have a third camp, um, which includes the governments of Hungary, Poland, um, uh, the outgoing um, uh, the prime minister of the Czech Republic or of Czechia, sorry, um, who argues who argue that the increases of ETS are leading to higher energy prices, that the Green Deal and the Fit for 55 um, is leading to higher energy prices. But that has been fought back immediately, not only by the Commission but by a majority of member states arguing that Fit for 55 is an answer to the problem we're now facing. And that, then there's a different, uh, besides these interpretations about where we are with respect to the energy prices and where we're going, there are also different national situations and interests. Um, the energy mixes of countries are very different, some depending much more on, goal, on, on coal, on gas, others being stronger in renewables, others being strong on nuclear. So these differences between member states also lead to very different preferences in reaction to the price increases mm. and to the energy crisis. Um, so it's no coincidence, for example, that um, the French president, but also Babis um, from, from Czechia are pushing for nuclear energy because this is something which seem, is, it, from their in, is in their in, international interest. And they want nuclear to be con considered a green energy source and that financial support will be given to that. So you see that you have a plethora of different positions. So this within. thinking, I mean, it, it looks as if, um, Fabian, that they are really seizing this crisis, seizing these energy prices uh, to fight other battles, to fight the battles over Fit for 55, uh, to fight the battles over the Green Deal. Um, and it is becoming a pretext, particularly among populist, uh, the more populist of our leaders, um, it's being hijacked. And, and that helps explain why they spent so long on it. Um, how do you read that? To some extent, I think this is inevitable um, because uh, this is a very real domestic political problem for all of the political leaders. Um, it's very hard um, to preside over a situation where um, your households or your industry or both have to pay significantly more um, also with uh, the inequitable impact that inevitably has. Um, mm. And if you're then also in a situation where maybe you don't have the means to do something about it uh, in the short term, uh, then you have to find someone else who's responsible for it. But I think you're right. Uh, there are a number of uh, proxy debates which are being held uh, on this topic. Um, they include this debate around um, the division of competences uh, between the European Union and uh, some particular populist state. There is a question about the Green Deal. Um, I've heard uh, some of the countries very uh, actively saying that essentially this situation is caused by the European Union. Um, 
uh, but there's also in the background a geopolitical question. Uh, and this reminds me very much of debates we've had uh, on energy security 10 years back about Russian gas and how we deal with that. Um, so uh, there are many uh, debates which are in there. Um, but I think we, we have to be also uh, a bit more um, realistic about uh, what is actually happening. Uh, clearly, um, we have a problem in energy markets and not just in the European Union. This is happening elsewhere as well. Uh, we have a, a real problem with volatility of prices. And that is something we need to think about. How can we get the volatility under control? That, um, uh, particularly when markets are tight, uh, because you have these spot markets where um, the, the, the gas is being traded, it leads very quickly to a bottleneck and then the prices shoot up. So some of, of these increases will also die down again um, in, in the near future, but you need to deal with what impact they have. Um, in the I to, just, just to follow up, and Yanis, I will come back to you on those broader dimensions in a moment, but just to follow up on that, in terms of those camps that, that Yanis described, Fabian, where, where would you sit in terms of, uh, it's a short-term problem that will sort itself out, the free market argument, if you like. Uh, we need to look at, we need firm action at EU level, regulatory changes, or we need to look at some of these other issues. Where do you sit in terms of, where, what, how much the EU needs to do, and really, does it have the levers to pull to help them with this domestic problem? Isn't it all about taxes, subsidies, and so on that will happen at national level? Um, um, I certainly wouldn't sit uh, in the camp which is blaming the European Union for uh, all of this, not. or which is denying uh, that uh, action on climate change um, is needed urgently. Um, I think that's also something which needs to be recalled that in the end, uh, when we're talking about climate change, we are talking about an existential threat uh, to uh, life on the planet. So it's not quite in the same category as, as some of these other debates. But I think there, there are these two different elements. We have to deal with the volatility, but we also have to look at price levels over time. And there is a real um, issue there when we're talking about the energy transition. Uh, that we need to find ways of uh, ensuring that, yes, energy prices reflect um, what impact they have, not only uh, in terms of economics, but also in terms of the environment, in terms of climate change. But at the same time, we also need to look at uh, how fair that transition is going to be, how equitable it's going to be. Because if some people are ending up paying the vast majority uh, of these increases, then that is an issue. So we have to find the right way. Um, but I think it also comes back to a rather fundamental point. And that is that while we have some areas where we have European competence, when it comes to the energy mix, when it comes to many of the decisions which you are now talking about in terms of taxation, et cetera, these are purely national competences. Um, so they can come together, they can try to coordinate, uh, but for the moment, they're not willing Absolutely. to actually put this at the European level. Absolutely. And Yanis, just a comment, if you would, something strange happening with our sound here. Um, a comment, if you would, uh, to this broader question. Uh, Fabian mentioned there the geo political question, how similar this is to debates. And we saw indeed some very strong debate about Russia and dependence. Bab is saying, for example, uh, you're killing yourself if you think we won't be dependent uh, on Russia. Um, others warning that's a dangerous road to stay on. Um, how do you see this and this link, this proxy debate, so linking it to other domestic issues? Well, first of all, I think that um, this energy discussion, as we've said, is something which brings a lot of strengths together and links different issues with each other. Um, so the dimension, the broader dimension, Jackie, you mentioned at some point that potentially the energy issue might be the issue which populists might be playing with in future. So there are these concerns. Um, the um, geopolitical dimension, or you could even call it the Russian dimensions, where there's a discussion happening as to whether actually the behavior of the Russian government of Gazprom is playing into the problem we're now having. And there are differences of opinion, but definitely there is an economic dimension and also a geopolitical dimension, including also Nord Stream, uh, which relates to the energy discussion and the Russian dimension linked to it. Um, the inflation danger, 
uh, the fear that uh, this high, these high energy prices could foster inflation and how that will affect um, how national central banks and the European Central Bank will react to that and how that potentially might influence economically uh, the recovery process. So there are a lot of dimensions which play into this. And I would expect that I think a lot of what we see, what we saw at this summit, which was about kicking the can further down the road, mm -hmm. seeing how will things develop? How will be the situation in December or in March when we have the next um, uh, ordinary European summit? So how far do we actually have to go in order to deal with this crisis? Um, and then as Fabian was explaining, um, this issue is not going to disappear. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just indicating of how difficult it will be when we get to more of the concrete discussions when we make this energy transition, yeah. how we deal with okay. climate change. So these issues will be coming back and it's just showcasing how difficult also the upcoming years will be until at least the end of this cycle and to move forward with Absolutely. respect to these issues. Fabian, you wanted to come in, can I ask you to make it a quick one because we need to move on. Yeah, just very quickly on uh, the economic um, dimension and inflation. I just wanted to say that, uh, of course, there have also been voices because we now see an increase in inflation driven by energy prices. Um, there are now voices which are then uh, concluding that uh, now is the time um, to become more restrictive in monetary policy for the ECB um, to start uh, tapering uh, their, their programs. Um, I think this is incredibly dangerous. Uh, we have a very fragile recovery that is fragile um, on a number of different uh, bases. We have these energy prices, which is um, a very particular problem. So if that particular problem now leads to a situation where we are risking the whole recovery uh, through the, a too fast exit from these measures, uh, then that would be uh, disastrous for the European economy. So Absolutely. I would hope that also in the discussion, particularly in countries like Germany, which are always very focused on inflation, there's a bit of realism that this is not the biggest problem we are facing at the moment. And not very long ago, we were very much worried about deflation. So let's Absolutely. put this into perspective. I want to move on shortly to the big issue, the other big issue, uh, as Yanis mentioned at the beginning, the rule of law discussion. But before we do that, Fabian, two words are on digital. Uh, because this was supposed to be one of the central discussions of this summit. Digital, of course, alongside green, seen as uh, this is the way we have a recovery, we build back better, uh, we accelerate the green transition through the use of recovery and resilience money and so on. Um, yet it seems we haven't seen the conclusions yet, but what we have seen emerge from the discussion, a lot of focus on cybersecurity, suggestions of delays in the Digital Service Act, the digital single market. I mean, where are we? Um, and are you concerned that on the issue people say that will define the economies of the future, we are really beginning to lag because it's moving too slowly? Um, there, there are really two dimensions I would highlight here. Um, I would take a bit of issue with um, the comment you're making about beginning to lag. I think it's a bit too late for that. <laughs> Indeed. Um, uh, we are lagging um, in many of these technologies, not in all, because there are still areas where, where Europe is, is strong, also in this field. But in many of the crucial areas, um, we have been lagging and we've been lagging for a while. Um, and uh, what uh, this unfortunately uh, reminds me of, and I haven't seen the conclusions yet, um, but is this uh, continuous reiteration of um, how much we really want to be at the forefront of some of these developments, but without really very much concrete behind it. Um, mm. And the question of how do we actually do that? Are we willing uh, to put um, also significant amounts of money behind it? Yes, the uh, recovery and resilience funds are also targeted at digital. Um, but what we're talking about here is something which should involve the whole of the European Union and it needs a very significant effort. And I'm afraid that some of our competitors are much uh, less slow than we are in terms of doing that. So the danger is actually that we're falling further behind uh, yeah. rather than um, catching up. Okay. And I, I think the other dimension just to, to say, which is very important in this context, is that this is an international dimension and that you also see uh, that there is a discussion on cybersecurity in particular, uh, because this is about geopolitics. Um, and uh, I think the most 
significant thing which probably happened in terms of digital is not what is being discussed at the summit. What is most important, I would say, at the moment is that an agreement has been reached with the US uh, on the digital tax and the, the retaliatory measures which were there um, to actually find a way forward on that. But that is significant. Um, I'm afraid I don't think that the conclusions of the summit will be very significant. No, will not move the dial in any significant way. Okay, let us move on uh, to the other deeply contentious issue at the summit. And I'm delighted to welcome Sophie Bornschlegel to join us now. Sophie, great to have you back with us. Uh, hello there. Uh, Sophie, you've been following the twists and turns of this argument. Now, Charles Michel said in his invitation letter to the summit that we would touch upon recent developments related to the rule of law but I, they did quite a lot more than touch upon it, uh, and yet nothing in the council conclusions. First of all, what actually has happened in this discussion and why on earth, if there was a conversation about it, is there nothing in the conclusions? Does that reflect how difficult that conversation was? Sophie. Yes, so, I mean, you mentioned it rightly. I think that the, the conversation is extremely difficult and it's a sensitive issue because no one expected uh, countries to have such kind of democratic backsliding. We know we have the Copenhagen criteria, but there's not much there um, to make sure that countries um, respect uh, democracy and human rights and the fundamental values that we have. So it is a sensitive discussion. I think it wasn't part of the council conclusions of day one um, to also not give any kind of, you know, extra sweets to the Polish government who could then use it to say that the other member states are victimizing Poland and that they're not treated equally, because that's what's something that the Polish prime minister repeated in his um, speech in front of the European parliament, that there was no equal treatment, you know, and that uh, Poland is um, discriminated against. And I think that was the reason why they didn't want to put it there. I think uh, what was interesting to see is that they uh, kicked the can down the road once again, that they said the commission was the guardian of the treaties and therefore they should deal with it. I think that we won't see a political um, consensus on this issue and also no political will from the biggest countries, which are France and Germany, unfortunately, and Italy that had a very cautionary approach saying that, you know, it's not something that we should discuss. So there was this balance, Sophie, just to follow up with you, between Mark Rutte, for example, Dutch Prime Minister, saying it's time to trigger the conditionality mechanism, uh, the link between yeah. EU budget funds and these violations. The European Parliament, intriguingly, taking the European Commission to court. Not sure I understand quite what the legal basis is for that challenge. I, I don't know whether they, it's a gesture or they think it can really make a difference. How do you see an Angela Merkel, of course, saying, oh, let's be careful, dialogue, caution, mm -hmm. Don't go too fast. At the moment, but two very distinct camps. We've got to be tough. This is an existential issue versus slow down, take it calm. How How is that, do you think, going to play out? Yeah, maybe on the framing, I think it's because yes. there is a framing of uh, dialogue versus confrontation. I think it's a dangerous one because dialogue, of course, is important. But the problem is that those who are advocating for dialogue at this point mean appeasement mostly, saying we're not going to do anything about this. And I think the problem is that it's it's a real issue. If the constitutional tribunal that is not independent anymore says that uh, we don't accept the primacy of EU law, then it's a real problem for the EU because it's the fundament. I mean, what's the point in having a legislative process at EU level when you don't apply it and implement the, the legislation? So I think there is a real issue of, you know, framing it of dialogue and confrontation, whereas confrontation would mean we respect the rules and we're making use of the actions that we can have, such as Article 7. I know it's flawed, but that's not really pushed forward either. The infringement procedures and especially um, the most effective tools, which are freezing the funds of the recovery plan and putting into action the conditionality mechanism. And I don't, I don't think that after this council, what you can see is that it's unlikely that this conditionality mechanism will go forward and the EP is really active and trying to, to, to make things go forward. If that's really helpful, I'm not quite sure. I think from a legal perspective, it's not really sure whether it will work out, uh, you know, that they're taking the commission to court. And also, I'm not sure it's good for the U.S. such when you have this interinstitutional conflicts. But mm -hmm. it's a sign that you really have different uh, opinions and different views from the different institutions. And this indeed has been something, Yanis, that, that has been the case uh, for a long time in these discussions on rule of law issues. And if you like, it's now coming to a head. Uh, but, but this tension between those who think you confront and those who think you dialogue has been there and has been at the 
heart of, of how difficult the EU has found it to, to resolve this issue, to address it. How serious for you is it? I mean, some people say the very future of the EU, Sophie said, this is about the fundamentals of how the EU runs. The very future of the EU is at stake, and therefore they say we have no option but what you would call confrontation. How do you read that? First of all, it is serious. And it is serious both from a legal perspective, but it's also serious from a political perspective. And I think we need to have both in mind. But this is a very difficult situation. But let me first of all say that I think in the past we have tried to push these discussions away from the European Council. We've tried to avoid these discussions in the European Council. And there are arguments why this made sense. Um, however, however, and that is, was what I was trying to indicate in the beginning when we were talking about the mood music, music um, I think that there is no um, real, not only reason, but also ability to push this to the side. There is a need to have a discussion, like the one we had in June about Hungary and LGBTIQ+, plus, but also the one we have now with respect to rule of law in Poland, um, because these things need to be discussed, trying to avoid it is pretending. Um, now, if you have these kind of discussions, do you think that this will solve the issue among the heads of state and government? No, because there is no consensus. Um, however, it's putting pressure. And I think that is important. So dialogue is not only about appeasement, it's also about putting pressure on the other side. And now everyone knows that there is a good proportion of governments and heads of state and government who are, ex who are very critical of what is happening in this case in Poland, and it is a very critical situation. And they're also thus lending political support to those, especially with respect to the commission, and those who are putting pressure on the commission to say, we need to do more. We need to increase the leverage. However, having said that, you have these dilemmata, you have these problems, which uh, Sophie were indicating. You want on the one hand to be clear, to put pressure, in this case on Poland, on the current Polish government, and um, you don't also want to play into the hands of those who argue, well, you, you see what, what Brussels is doing? They're trying to punish us, to discriminate us. So you have to very carefully make your argument. Um, so ar arguing we will not free the money from, from, the, from the recovery fund uh, for Poland in order to punish is the wrong argument. The argument is that we don't trust in the independence of the Polish judiciary. And that's why we have consideration in making sure that money starts flowing. Uh, on the basis of the national um, recovery and resilience plans from the from, of Poland, um, and then you have the question of what happens if the situation escalates, if you get into an impasse, and how would it then also potentially spill over into other issue areas? Now, I don't think that this is impeachment. I think this is an analysis of the situation, and the question is then, what do you do? And that's not an easy one. I don't envy those who now have to take the decisions of how to deal with this. It is a very tough cookie. Um, but on the other hand, appeasement is wrong. Dialogue for the purpose of just having dialogue is wrong. So you need to well, find the right in between. We'll, we'll come back to that in a moment. Fabian, your analysis of, of where we are and the potential ramifications. I want to put a bit of realpolitik into this um, because I think, uh, yes, there are principles at stake. But what it reminds me very much um, of is the kind of debate you have before you impose economic sanctions on a country. And the question is, what are you trying to achieve? Um, do we expect that if we use whatever tools we have, and if we use the whole range of tools, we have nothing left in the toolbox um, to go afterwards? So if we use all of that, do we expect that the Polish government will do a U-turn, will change uh, it, its tune. If not, then we have to be willing to have these sanctions, these measures in place permanently. And is that really something which is going to be uh, in the end um, bringing us forward? Because if these are in place over a prolonged period of time, it also has real implications for economic growth, for the way um, people in Poland will see the European Union. So I think it is an area where we have to do something. I was going to say, I if would we be do very nothing, cautious yeah. about using all of the means which we have, because then we have nothing left. And if it doesn't resolve it at this point in time, it becomes very difficult. Mm. 
Sophie, uh, your reaction yeah. to, to that comment and, and where lot, you think that lies. I mean, as you said, you didn't like the framing of it, dialogue versus yes. Religion, but you yes. said we have to take the action we can, because if we don't, we don't have an option of not. Fabian saying, yeah, but don't use all your tools because where do you go from there? I mean, I think Fabian has a point because the, the options we have and the instruments we have are extremely restricted also due to the fact that Article 7 is flawed because that would be really the biggest sanction we have. There's no exit card in a say we can't throw someone out and they haven't triggered Article 50. So it's not, it's not a polite exit in that sense. And Article 7 is the next big thing we have, but it's so flawed that you will never have voting suspensions of Hungary and Poland because we didn't expect two countries to be at this at this point in time. When it comes to the argument of escalation that Yanis made, I'm not, I'm not sure I agree with it because we already have this escalation. I mean, we had uh, Hungary and Poland vetoing uh, almost the EU budget in December 2020. Uh, now we have the discussion about the ETS and energy prices. So you can see that there's already this escalation. And the question is whether you think short term or long term. And in the long term, not activating the tools we have um, also leads simply to undermining the whole EU project as such, because then you agree having uh, authoritarian countries as they are very much underway. And in Hungary, I, I mean, if you look at, for instance, democracy uh, monitorings, they already say that it's, it's an authoritarian country, then you, you let that be. And it's um, it's very difficult to to come to, you know, political consensus with such countries. So I'm not sure. Um, I, I think it's sensitive, but um, we also have to think more long term. <coughs> One last point, Jackie, is about dialogue and putting political pressure. I'm not quite sure France and Germany are putting the political pressure they could. Um, the comment that Merkel made today, saying uh, yesterday, was um, saying that um, you know it's about different views on European integration. I think that's really wrong, and it's not about having different views on European integration. We all have different views on European integration, but it's about respecting the rules now. And I think you know not putting the political pressure um, from those countries. And to talk realpolitik, it's Poland isn't a net contributor country, so I think there are political tools there to make sure that they would respect the rule. It would be much more difficult if it was a country like France or Germany. Absolutely. And Sophie, you must be psychic, because as you said those words, Jus van Heersel uh, wrote, what is your opinion on the Merkel statement that the Polish case is a matter of how you look at the EU? Is it ever closer union, increasing intergovernmentalism? Just says, in my view, this would be a dangerous pathway as it opens a Pandora's box. Yeah. The second option is a slippery road anyway. So you and Just of one mind on this. Um, Yanis and Fabian, I know you both want to come in. I mean, I just want to pick up on something Sophie said, because she said there is no exit card. We can't throw them out. And I've heard people saying the worst outcome of all of this is not that Poland leaves the EU. It's that Poland says it has no desire to leave the EU. It stays in the club, but it doesn't respect the primacy of EU law, the bedrock of the union. What for you? I mean, <laughs> what is the worst outcome and the least worst outcome? Yanis. I think the worst outcomes are manifold. If we undermine the primacy of EU law, that is not what we can allow to happen. Second, if we allow the independence of a judiciary to be in doubt, as it is now in this case we're discussing, this is not an option. Second or third, the option of arguing in favor of, in this case, Poland, exiting the European Union is not for me a valid argument. It should not even be considered because this is not the solution either. It was not the solution when we were facing the so-called Greek crisis, and it's not the solution in the current situation. So we need to find for other ways while having all these three things in mind. And this is very much a political game which is being played. So when we talk about Poland, I think this is already the first mistake. We're talking about the current Polish government. Yeah. So we, as being outsiders, non-Polish, who have a great stake in what is happening in Poland because of being a family, of being, them being part of our family. So we have a strong stake. However, having said that, we need to be aware of what's happening in the country itself. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of discontent with the current government. There is opposition in Poland to what the government is doing with respect to EU affairs, including so the rule of law. Exactly. Um, so when we act from the outside, we always have to have that in mind. 
So there Fabian is right when he says, let's have real politic in mind. Huh? It's not something which can be purely value-based, but values when it comes to the rule of law are strong. They're not, they're not soft. They're extremely strong issues where we cannot bend and give up. Okay. However, having said that, you have to think of what are your options now? What will you be your options in six months time? Where will you be in nine months time? I think the strongest option we now have and Sophie was displaying, I think there are four options. Out of these four, the strongest we now have is not to approve the national Polish recovery and resilience plan. And I don't see after the discussion we've had now during this week and at the summit that the commission will be ready and can, even if it would want and it doesn't want, would, would be ready to provide its approval. It won't because now it has a stronger yeah. political backing. What will be the situation in six months time, in 12 months time, we have to see. It's like in politics always. Okay, yeah. There is no fixed solution now for all for forever. You need to see how things move. So that's, that's really echoing Fabian's argument of use some of your tools, but not all of your tools. Fabian. Well, the, the first thing I, I, I would say here is um, uh, let's not start from here. Um, I, I think uh, we should also be looking back and seeing some of the mistakes which have been made. And I think one of the, the major issues which is in the background is that Germany questioned the primacy of uh, European law. So uh, it's very hard to, uh, and, and this is an argument you hear all of the time in countries like Poland and, and Hungary. Um, it's not just us, it's others as well. Now I know there are loads of differences in that, but there is also an argument uh, which is derived from that, which says, if this kind of thing happens, it is the responsibility of the member state to sort it out. And it's only if this then leads to consequences, i.e. non-implementation of particular laws, not just the yeah. statement of it, but actually not doing it, then you can Which apply the, the kind of sanctions. So that, that, that's one thing. I think the exit card, as Janice is saying, I think this is also politically extremely dangerous because if we think this through to the end and we would get to a situation where Poland is thrown out um, in some form or other. What are we saying to populations all over Europe? We have one of the most pro-European population and a rogue government can then lead to a situation where they can propel their country out of the European Union. I, I think that's a disastrous message. So I don't think this is a, a really uh, an argument. I think one thing we can look at is and we shouldn't always lump Hungary and Poland together because the issues are very different. Um, I think with Hungary, the monetary argument is much stronger. It's a much greater lever uh, we can use. I think with Poland, um, we should be also thinking about diplomacy. We should be thinking about maybe there's a transatlantic component in terms of security, in terms of um, maybe there's a component here about uh, how certain countries in Europe are reacting to Russia, and it might make a difference to have a different government uh, in Berlin uh, when it comes to that. So I think there are other cards, other diplomacy channels which can be played here as well. Um, so I'm not saying that we shouldn't take action. That would be the wrong message. Uh, clearly, there has to be a response. But I think it has to be a graduated action and it has to be an action which also gives us the possibility to continue to escalate it in future if there are real breaches. Because okay. if we have got nothing left, then uh, we are in a really dangerous situation. Thank you. Sophie, your reaction uh, to the, the, this conversation, and it seems to me we are we're sort of not resolving the dilemma, but I, I think, I think the, the, the key thing that both of them are saying is, don't use all the tools because you've got nowhere to go. Uh, don't go for um, the Armageddon option of trying in some way, even though the EU rules don't allow it, to suggest that Poland might like to quietly. Um, what for you is, is the, the least worst outcome to all of this? Because I'm not sure we can talk about best outcomes at the moment. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a difficult issue, as both Yanis and Fabian mentioned, and I wouldn't say that, you know, we should uh, aim towards uh, Poland leaving the EU, That's, that shouldn't be the aim uh, in any case. 
Um, but it's a tricky situation. And I think what I really miss is more political pressure from certain countries that pretend to be so pro-democratic. And I don't think that you can compare it to Greece in the sense, because the big issue in the case of um, democratic backsliding is that you're not sure that you can actually have um, fair and free elections anymore. And so it's not really clear whether you can have a different government in a few years time. And I think that's also the kind of tricky part here because it's really the basis to make sure that potentially you can have a different government. It doesn't mean that all governments always have to be pro-European, but that at least you will have some change after a while. And I think if that's you know um, in question, it makes it really difficult. One last point about Fabian and comparing it to the German Constitutional Court um, yeah. head judgment. I think what's been really missing also in the media, I feel, is to explain the rule of law situation in Poland. And I'm not Polish, but what I've been hearing from all the rule of law experts is that we really have an issue. The Constitutional Tribunal is not independent. It's, it's a loudspeaker for the Polish government. And therefore, if it puts into question the entire primacy of EU law, instead of, you know, looking at different competences of the EU, that's really problematic. Absolutely. And I'm not quite sure how to solve it. And I don't think we will. And I wouldn't want to be Mrs. Merkel or Mrs. Macron at this point in time or anyone in the European Council. But I think they need to really think more long term and have a real strategy thinking about when to use which tools yeah. and also kind of looking at you know, monitoring the situation on the ground also and looking at what's happening in Poland, what's happening in Hungary, and how can we get out of this? Because I don't feel like there's a more long term strategy at the moment. No, and indeed, because MEPs, uh, when they were, were talking about the legal action that they've launched, I mentioned earlier, described the tribunal as, and I quote, a tool for legalizing the illegal activities of the authority. Sophie, can, if I can just take advantage of your other expertise, you've been following the coalition negotiations. Do you see, is it possible to detect what attitude a new German government will, will, will take? Will they stay on this cautious line that Angela Merkel always urging dialogue, dialogue, let's not rush to, to mm. action? I mean, is it, are they even talking about this sort of issue now? Can we say anything about what it's, what their reaction is likely to be? And then we, we need to move on. Um. I think one could expect maybe a little bit, a bit more of an ambitious reaction, especially depending on how much the Greens are willing to put in. I think the Greens have been extremely active on that topic. Um, the FDP, um, also, I would say also. So I think it, it will depend, but it's been mostly the CDU that was very much on the dialogue line. So it's not the biggest priority, I would say, in EU policy for you know, the coalition negotiations where they have so many topics to talk yeah. about. But so but we'll have to see how it evolves, but it could happen depending on which country really, uh, which party, excuse me, really wants to, to bring that topic forward and uh, whether they will be able to kind of put their mark on it. I'm sure we'll have you back to discuss that again when we know more about this coalition. But yeah, it's a very quick one, if you would, because I want to move on to the dreaded B word in a yeah. moment. Yeah, but I have to share these thoughts. One is you cannot compare the situation in Poland to the situation in, in Greece, which I was describing with respect to 2015. What you can compare is that for all those who argued at the time and who potentially argue today that there is an easy solution which is linked to an exit of these countries from the European Union, that that is a fata morgana. And it's even it's not only a fata morgana discussion, it's also dangerous mm -hmm. from the country's perspective and from the European perspective. Second, what we can learn from the Greek uh, case is that you have to understand what is happening in the country itself and act accordingly. And I have witnessed in 2015 that there were a lot of wrong interpretation of what was happening in Greece. So we should really rely on those who are telling us what is the situation in Poland and then act accordingly. I think that is a big message we can take from that. You cannot compare the situation with each other. The second point is, I think, yes, and we have been very critical um, if you remember, and we all remember, when we had the uh, decision of the Bundesverfassungsgericht at the time, saying also at the EPC update that this was a wrong decision from many perspectives, legal but also politically. However, what we have seen and what we're seeing in the Polish case is that the first time, it is the first time that a national constitute has outright declared that parts of EU primary law is incompatible with the EU's, the member states, with one of the member states, legal system, its constitution. That is different, a different from what the Bundesverfassungsgericht yeah. did. But politically, Fabian is right. What Karlsruhe did at the time was be sending the wrong signal. It's now being used. Yeah. 
It's being but you used by those who are undermining. Me, you both exactly. Said. That was yeah. the, that was a big mistake. However, the quality of what is happening in legal mm -hmm. terms is a different one. Okay. Thank you very much, Sophie. It's always great to have you uh, on update. I want to tell you, you're very welcome to stay, but I want to turn to the B word. I don't know whether you want to listen to this discussion. Uh, this was the, I hate this phrase, but I can't think of a better one, the elephant in the room, Fabian, wasn't on the agenda, but we have seen some extraordinary stuff in the last couple of weeks. Uh, first of all, we'll come to the, the mood music, the tone, but in terms of the latest proposals, so we've seen um, the EU putting forward a package of proposals to reduce the border frictions, which seemed to surprise a lot of people, went further than many people expected. Some people saying it's wrong footed the UK government. Um, how would you assess those proposals and line that up against what the UK is demanding um, and, and whether you can see any way when you look at those two sets of proposals next to each other, any way of reconciling them? I think firstly, um, to, to pick up a point you just made that um, it might have wrong-footed uh, the British government. Um, if that is the case, that implies that um, the British government was wrong-footed because they were given more than they actually wanted yes. um, because exactly. they wanted to create this trouble. Now that shows how low the trust is. Um, and frankly, uh, the relationship, whatever happens next, um, but the relationship is in deep, deep trouble. Uh, there is this friction um, around Northern Ireland uh, and the application of the protocol, um, but there are many other areas. Um, and frankly, uh, we are seeing a continuous escalation, not just in the rhetoric, but also in, in, in actions. Um, now, coming to the proposals on Northern Ireland, I think there has been a recognition, uh, rightly so, that there are um, concrete issues uh, which need to be addressed. Um, and what these proposals are trying to do is to go quite specific into some of these areas and to say, how can we solve, for example, issues around medicine or how can we uh, resolve issues around um, food and drink um, so that um, people in Northern Ireland um, don't have the feeling that they're being cut off um, from uh, the rest mm -hmm. of the UK. Now the question is, is that what the British government wants? Is it actually about um, any of these concrete issues or is it about um, a political fight for domestic purposes. Um, and my indication would be that uh, the issue they have picked on, at least in public so far, has been the European Court of Justice. Mm -hmm. Now, I find it very difficult to find any rational link between the concrete issues which are happening on the ground in Northern Ireland and the European Court of Justice. This is the old argument around sovereignty, around taking back control, around not being controlled by Brussels. So in the end, uh, we have an ideological position. Now, the UK government seems to be indicating maybe there's some wriggle room for uh, a compromise. Uh, but in the end, uh, I'm afraid even if we do get over this immediate hurdle, it's not going to resolve anything because what we have is essentially a government in London which will continue to use any issue in the EU-UK yeah. relationship for its domestic purposes. Um, and that's so what you meant. Much more yeah. And that's what you meant when you tweeted on the day of, of Lord Frost's speech. And by the way, extraordinary timing. You make an incredibly aggressive speech on the eve of the EU publishing proposals. Doesn't suggest that you're eagerly awaiting those proposals uh, to see if there's a way of resolving your very substantive issues. You called it a calculated insult. You think it was deliberate provocation. Uh, and Yanis, I want to come on to the consequences of that in a minute. But Fabian, when you called it a calculated insult, were you saying he's deliberately prodding the beast, as it were? Absolutely. And I, I, it is not the first time. Uh, I think um, Lord Frost certainly has form when it comes to that. I think what we are seeing is an extraordinary behavior um, by uh, the country, which in the end did sign the protocol, did negotiate the protocol. So Said it was great. Not... Said it was great. Yes, absolutely. Um, but I think uh, there, there are two elements to this. Uh, one element is that there's a belief in the UK, uh, 
particularly in the government, but also in the media and some other, that uh, to get what you want from the European Union, you have to be tough. Yeah. You have to be um, uh, as confrontational as Lord Frost is, uh, has been. Um, also in, in terms of threatening to not implement the protocol, threatening not to follow the rules, etc. And uh, some people think that this is the reason why they are constructive proposals exactly. from the EU. Yes, and that is the narrative doesn't quite fit if you look at the reality. Um, but for domestic consumption in the UK, it works. Yeah, but, but the other part of this, but and I think this is um, probably more worrying. Now you could say, okay, fine, if there's a political game. Um, and maybe it's good then that we have a commission which is not uh, so much driven by domestic politics, mm -hmm. so they can just absorb that kind of political pressure. But unfortunately, I think there's more than that behind it. I think what we are talking about here is a real hostility against yeah. the European Union, against uh, any kind of cooperation. Uh, and I think this really bodes um, badly for the relationship. And I think we need to watch out. Um, there might be some more conciliatory noises right now because of COP26. Yeah. Because the last thing uh, which right, right. Johnson wants is uh, an embarrassment uh, in terms of, of COP26. But if COP26 doesn't turn out well, then I would expect that we see more attacks on the European Union you can be sure that it's okay. the European Union's fault if that happens. I was going to say, Yanis, I mean, the EU is caught between a rock and a hard place. If it doesn't uh, suggest that it is listening to the concerns, it is, as Fabian said, recognising there are concrete issues that need to be addressed, which it's done through these proposals, then the UK government says it's all the EU's fault. They're not willing uh, to make this work and make it work for everyone. If it does make the sort of proposals it's just made, the UK government and those around it say, you see, talk tough with these guys, you get what you want. So let's ask for even more, let's talk even tougher. How, how on earth is the EU supposed to negotiate? I mean, this, this undermines the very basis upon which negotiations between uh, independent sovereign states, as Lord Frost likes to always underline, uh, are conducted, does it not? I think that finding ways or trying to find ways to find compromises on the basis of rational arguments and consideration is the right thing to do. And that is something which in a difficult political situation like the one we're experiencing in our relationship with the current uh, government in London um, is something we should follow. Because as Fabian said, there is a lack of rationality on the other side. There are immense national considerations. There's a game being played on the other side. We should not follow, uh, uh, follow in that trap. We need to be aware of what's happening on that side and react accordingly, but not with the same kind of irrationality. Mm. So if we come up with proposals which we consider to reflect some of the problems and we want to divert pressure from the situation and being wise in the way how we operate, um, being the mature one in the room, I think this remains the right way of doing it. Um, now, with respect to the question of toughness, if on, in London some argue, look, we need to be tough, tougher, then we get what we want, this has been and it will be a miscalculation. And we've discussed this in the past. Uh, I assume that the situation, in case there's an escalation between both sides, you will see that you will have even tougher actors on the other side. Yeah. I don't see that a French government, a French president in the midst of his electoral campaign will be less tough. I don't see that the German side because of the new government will be less tough. I think that that will continue. So this will be, has been, and will be continued to be a miscalculation. But this, is, this has always been a feature of, of the British approach, which is you only consider yes. your own domestic problems. You don't consider ever the domestic situation of others. But a last question, Fabian, and then we need to go. This may be a very naive question to even ask this, but from a legalistic point of view, given the EU offer, do you think this makes it more difficult for the UK now to trigger Article 16? Because it's supposed to be, you can only take unilateral measures if applying the protocol is causing specific difficulties and the EU has addressed those. So, or does that not matter? 
could they go ahead and trigger Article 16, uh, whatever, because it's not about the legalistic position, it's only about the politics? Briefly, if you would. I think the UK has never considered what the legal background uh, to Article 16 is. This is about politics, pure and simple. Might make it more difficult to trigger it because it might not look the same way. But that's a, a different argument. But I, I wanted to say one word because I, I agree with Yanis about uh, the willingness to compromise. But there is also something which I think is not clear now. And that is, where's the EU's red line? Where's the bit where it just mm -hmm. cannot go further? Yeah. Um, and there are many people on the inside who are saying, we're getting very close to that point. Um, and the point here really is about uh, the position of Ireland within the European Union and within the single market. And that is really a very tough red line, uh, which is there and it's not going to move. And I think it needs to be clearer, both in private and in public, uh, that there is a point which is coming soon when the EU is not going to move anymore. Absolutely. And on that note, gentlemen, I wish we had longer, but we don't. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you for joining us so late on a Friday afternoon. We did, as I say, want to, want to bring you the latest developments from the summit hot off the presses, and they don't get hotter than doing it while the summit's still going on. But thank you very much for joining us uh, and have a great weekend. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>